uh, inviting me, I guess, if um, given that yes, it's being recorded, we can share that later. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, just getting these notifications from Teams. Okay. Uh, so to begin, the presentation that I prepared today um, is based on research that I've been conducting over the last year with Ebo Vanderpol. Uh, we noticed that despite the continually growing litanies of AI codes, ethics guidelines, principles, there's little being done, at least uh, recently, on bridging this theory practice gap. So our aim was to find a nexus in research and use the value sensitive design approach as a methodology for translating these more abstract philosophical principles into practice. So past research has explored on how VSD, I'll just keep using VSD just for brevity's sake to refer to value sensitive design, which I'll explain later, uh, can be applied to specific technologies such as energy systems, mobile phone usage, architecture projects, manufacturing, augmented reality, just to name a few. It has similarly uh, been proposed as a suitable design framework for even future technologies, both in near and long term. Examples include uh, exploratory applications to nanopharmaceuticals, molecular manufacturing, intelligent agent systems, and less futuristically autonomous vehicles. Uh, and although these studies do provide a useful theoretical basis for how VSD can be applied to specific technologies, they don't account for the unique ethical and technical issues that various AI systems present. And there is ample discussion about the risks, benefits, uh, and impacts of AI, although the exact effects of AI on society are neither clear nor certain. But what is beyond doubt is that AI is and will continue to have a pr profound impact on human flourishing more broadly construed. And several scholars have already explored the ethical concerns and values necessary to construct AI towards socially better beneficial ends. AI is a nebulous term and it's often used haphazardly. Uh, our use of the term AI then is understood as the class of technologies that are autonomous, interactive, adaptive, and carry out human-like tasks. In particular, we're interested in AI technologies that are based on machine learning, which allows such technologies to learn on the basis of interaction with and feedback from its environment. These learning capabilities pose, as we aim to argue, specific challenges for value sensitive design in particular. AI technologies that are more likely than not to acquire features that were neither foreseen nor intended by their designers, and in addition to the way they learn and evolve, may be opaque to humans. In order to address these challenges, we suggested that a set of AI specific design principles need to be added to value sensitive design. We propose to build on the significant headway that has recently been made in the numerous AI for social goods, AI for SG, uh, the abbreviation, um, as in the title of my presentation, um, which are project. Um, so um, this, the practical on the ground applications of AI for social good factors are already enacted for various AI enabled technologies. And this provides research with a solid groundwork for how ethics manifests itself in practice. However, AI for social good is difficult and its underlying principles are still fuzzy, given the multiplicity of research domains, practices, and design programs. Yet some work has already been done to narrow down the essential AI for social good factors. So to clarify, what I want to propose here today is that value sensitive design provides a principled approach that diverse design teams can adopt regardless of domain to formalize their approach to design AI for social good along these factors. Although other tools for achieving responsible research and innovation have been proposed, VSD in particular is chosen as the design methodology because of its inherent self-reflexivity and its emphasis on engaging with both direct and indirect stakeholders as a fundamental part of the design process and the philosophical investigation of values. So I structured my talk into roughly six main parts. I'm not sure if I, okay. So I'll just, uh, I'll switch to the value sensitive design one here. In the first part, I will lay out the value sensitive design framework. 
albeit I, I'm sure most of uh, those who are listening uh, at least have a running familiarity with it. Uh, so I'll only do so briefly. Uh, the second section describes why it is challenging to apply value sensitive design to artificial intelligence. In the third part, I outline the motivations and descriptions of the AI for social good factors as a way to address the specific challenges raised by AI for BSD. Um, in section four, I'll outline a design approach inspired by value sensitive design and the AI for social good factors, illustrating an organic symbiosis of the two. Uh, and in the, the final section, I use the example of a specific contact tracing app to provide a preliminary illustration of the approach. Um, and then I'll close with some summary and some concluding thoughts. So I think uh, ideally, if anybody wants to ask questions, given that I've divided this into five, six sections, maybe we can do so at the end of each section. Uh, and then um, those questions could just uh, be communicated to me before we move on to the next section. So value sense of design. Value sensitive design is a often construed as a principled approach to take values of ethical importance into account in the design of new technologies. The original approach was developed by Batya Friedman and colleagues from the University of Washington, but the approach is now more widely adopted and has been developed further by others, sometimes under somewhat different headings like values at play or at Delft, design for values. At the core of the BSD approach is what uh, Friedman and company called the tripartite methodology, as you can see here, of empirical, conceptual, and technical investigations. These investigations can be carried out consecutively, in parallel, iteratively, uh, or iteratively, and they involve one, empirically investigating the relevant stakeholders, their values, and their value things and priorities. Uh, sorry. Uh, 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 just as a note, I'm not able to see what the next slide is uh, in Microsoft Teams, so that may be a, a future note, unlike uh, screen sharing the PowerPoint directly, so I can't uh, anticipate the next slide. So just forgive me if I just go back and forth quickly. Um, so these this iterative uh, investigations involve one, uh, empirically investigating the relevant stakeholders, their values and value understandings and priorities. Secondly, conceptual investigations into values and possible value trade-offs or moral overload. And three, technical investigations into value issues raised by current technology and possible impl uh, implementation of values into new designs. Friedman and Hendry, for example, propose 17 more specific methods that can be used in value sensitive design ranging from stakeholder analyses and tokens to value-oriented mockups and multi-lifespan code design. One important issue in BSD is how to identify the values that should be taken into account in a concrete VSD process. Friedman and company propose a list of 13 values um, that are important for the design of information systems like human welfare, ownership and property, privacy, and freedom from bias, among others. Others have proposed such an approach and argue that it is better to elicit values bottom up from stakeholders. Both approaches probably have their advantages and disadvantages. A value list may well miss out on values that are important in a specific situation, but are not on the list. Although bottom up elicitation may help to discover such values, it's also not watertight as important values may not be articulated by the stakeholders or crucial stakeholders may not have even been identified. Moreover, not every value held by stakeholder is a value of ethical importance that even should be included in value sensitive design. For the case of AI, some considerations are important when it comes to identifying values in the VSD design process of AI technologies. First, there is now widespread consensus that AI raises specific, specific ethical issues, which are not, or at least to a much lesser degree, raised by more conventional uh, information and communication technologies. This has two implications for the issue of value identification. First, the original VSD list of values does not suffice for AI. Instead, one may, for example, take the values identified by the high-level expert group 
uh, on the ethics of AI as a starting point. So respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness and explicability. Secondly, some value list would seem desirable for the case of AI to ensure that the typical ethical concerns that arise from AI are not overlooked. This is not to say that no other value should be included in the design of AI applications. They should, and some form of bottom-up elicitation may be relevant here, but it should be su uh, supplemented by principles that ensure that typical AI ethical issues are properly addressed. And we propose to have recourse to the AI for social good factors that I'll discuss more in the third session uh, section. So the challenges posed by artificial intelligence to value sensor design. AI applications pose some specific challenges when it comes to BSD more generally, and this is particularly due to the self-learning capabilities of AI. This complicates the reliable integration of values in the design of technologies that employ artificial intelligence. So we can use a short imaginary but illustrative example, and then we can discuss in more general terms the complications raised by AI for value sensitive design. So suppose a tax uh, department of a certain country wants to develop an algorithm that helps to detect potential cases of fraud. More specifically, the application should help civil servants to select those citizens whose tax declaration needs extra or special scrutiny. Now, suppose they choose to build a self-learning artificial neural net for this task, like you can see here. An artificial neural network consists of a number of input units, hidden units, and one or more output units. Uh, so let's suppose that the output unit or variable is simply a yes, no, indicating whether a specific tax declaration needs additional scrutiny. The input variables or units can be many, including, for example, the amount of tax to be paid by a certain citizen, the use of a specific tax exemption, prior history of the person, for example, suspicion, uh, a fraud in the past, but also personal details like age, sex, place of living, etc. The units or variables in the artificial neural network are connected as you can see in the figure. The connection between the units can be weight factors that are learned by the algorithm. This learning can be supervised or not. If supervised learning is applied, uh, if supervised learning is applied, uh, the algorithm may learn to make calls on what tax declarations need to be scrutinized that are similar to those of experienced civil servants at the tax office. In the case of unsupervised learning information on which scrutinized cases lead to detection of actual fraud may be fed back into the algorithm and it may be programmed to learn to select those cases that have the highest probability of leading to the detection of actual fraud. Now, one of the values that is obviously important in the design of such an algorithm is freedom from bias. This value is already included in the original list of value sensitive design values proposed by Friedman and Kahn back in 2002. Um, and Friedman and Nissenbaum defined freedom from bias in reference to computer systems that systematically and unfairly discriminate against certain individuals or groups of individuals in favor of others. I'm not sure if I wrote that here. No. Uh, in traditional VSD, this may be implemented in the design of the algorithm in a number of ways. First and foremost, it may be translated into design requirements that none of the variables in the artificial neural network, the nodes in this figure, uh, uses. Such variables may lead to unwanted bias. For example, ethnicity may be ruled out as a potential variable. However, this will not be enough to ensure the realization of the value freedom from bias, as bias may also be introduced through proxy variables. For example, postal codes may be used as a proxy variable for ethnicity, and one may also want to rule out the use of such variables to ensure freedom from bias. But even then, a self-learning algorithm may be biased due, due to the way it learns. It may, for example, be biased because the training set for the algorithm is not representative or it's skewed. If a form of supervised learning is chosen, it's conceivable that the algorithm learns from the bias that was already in human judgments. They're already used for the supervised learning. But even if these potential 
sources of bias have been excluded, it can't be guaranteed that the resulting algorithm is not biased. Certainly not if a form of non-supervised reinforcement learning is chosen. One issue is that the resulting artificial neural network may be described as following a certain rule, even if the rule was never encoded, nor can be easily derived from the variables in the artificial neural network. In other words, it is conceivable that the resulting algorithm can be described as following a rule that is somehow biased without the result being foreseeable or even clearly discernible. This means that bias in the algorithm, in this imaginary at least, may be emergent and opaque. Emergent in the sense that it is an unintended and unforeseen consequence from the way the algorithm has learned. Opaque in the sense that it may be it may not be immediately clear for humans from inspection of the algorithm or artificial neural network that it is biased. The point is more general and doesn't just apply to the specific example uh, or the value of freedom from bias or fairness. Due to their self-learning capabilities, AI systems, in particular those powered by machine learning, may develop features that were never intended nor foreseen or not foreseeable by their designers. This is also uh, this also means that they may have unintended value consequences, and it can even imply that they unintentionally disembody values that were embedded in their original design. Moreover, uh, these unintended features may not always be discernible, as they may be due to specific ways the algorithm has developed itself that are hard or even impossible for humans to fully understand. Uh, the important point is that addressing emergence and opaqueness uh, requires a set of design principles or rather design norms uh, that are not needed for tr traditional technologies. Is there a reason? Oh, I'm not sure why my slides were automatically moving through, sorry. Uh, so some of these principles related to the technical or design requirements, others relate to the organization of the design process and the further life cycle of a product, like continued monitoring, and still others may have to do with what AI techniques are being used or not. Uh, so we're going to move into the next section, which will look at the proposed AI for social good factors as a way to address the specific challenges that AI poses for value sensitive design. Uh, yes, OK, so uh, the most thorough work on the harmonization of the of AI for social good values has been recently undertaken by uh, Luciano Floridi and company at the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, whose focus on factors that are particularly relevant to AI, uh, not exhausting the potential list of relevant factors. Uh, the seven factors that are particularly relevant for the design uh, of AI towards the social good are, uh, as you can see in the figure here, falsifiability and incremental deployment, safeguards against the manipulation of predictors, receiver contextualized intervention, receiver contextualized explanation and transparent purposes, privacy protection and data subject consent, situational fairness, and human friendly semanticization. The seven factors although discussed separately, naturally codepend and co-vary with one another and are not to be understood as rank, ordered, or in a hierarchy. Similarly, the seven factors each relate in some way to at least one of the four ethical principles that the EU high-level uh, high expert group on AI lays out. So uh, respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness, and explicability. This mapping on the more general values of ethical AI are not insignificant. Any divergence from these more general values and uh, of ethical AI um, has potentially deleterious consequences. What the seven factors are meant to do then is to specify these higher order values into more specific norms and design requirements. Uh, for the sake of time, I, I forgo the summarizing of the AI for social good factors. Uh, Floridian company do so quite succinctly in uh, their new paper published in Science and Engineering Ethics at the beginning of the year. 
So we'll move uh, along. So adopt the, uh, adapting the, the value sensitive design approach. Uh, in order to address the challenges posed uh, for VSD by artificial intelligence, we propose a somewhat adapted value sensitive design approach. These adaptions that uh, these um, adaptations uh, we propose are threefold. One is integrating the AI for social good factors in value sensitive design as design norms from which more specific design requirements can be derived. Secondly, distinguishing between values to be promoted by design and values to be respected by design to ensure that the resulting design not, does not only not do harm, but also contributes to doing good. And thirdly, extending value sensitive design process to encompass the whole life cycle of an AI technology in order to be able to monitor unintended value consequences and redesign the technology if necessary. So we first briefly explain these new features and then I'll sketch the, the overall process. So integrating AI for social good principles, we propose that uh, to map the AI for social good factors onto the norms category uh, used to translate values into technical design requirements and vice versa, we use uh, Evo van der Poel's value hierarchy. Uh, likewise, an entire typology of available practices and methods for turning the principles of AI for social good, beneficence, uh, beneficence non-maleficence, uh, autonomy, justice, explicability, uh, as well as case studies based uh, have been gathered by Digital Catapult uh, into an applied AI ethics typology. However, these methods remain pretty high level and are not specifically operationalized for designing for AI for social good. And for this reason, VST is proposed as an app starting point at the very least, given its theoretical overlap with AI for social good factors as norms for translating these values into design requirements. So, Distinguishing between values to be promoted and values to be respected uh, in order for the value sensitive design approach uh, to AI to be more than just avoiding harm and actually contributing to social good, an explicit orientation is required to socially desirable ends. Such an orientation is still missing in current proposals of AI for social good projects. We propose to address this by an explicit orientation to the sustainable development goals as proposed by the United Nations as a best approximation of what we collectively believe to be valuable societal ends. In 2015, all the member states of the United Nations adopted the then proposed 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, a proposal aimed at the design and implementation of goals towards a safe and sustainable future founded on an agreed desire uh, for global peace. The general adoption of the resolution is towards making actionable these 17 sustainable development goals that form its foundation. It recognizes that the included sustainable development goals must not be looked at as mutually exclusive of one another, rank ordered or as trade-offs, but rather so sustainable development goals uh, such as ending poverty and climate change remediation go hand in hand. Among ending poverty and climate change action, you can see that there's other goals such as affordable and clean energy industry, innovation and infrastructure, and sustainable cities and communities, just uh, to name a few. And thirdly, in the, that, the new tripartite steps are is extending VSD to the entire life cycle. So in order to address the emergent and possibly unintended properties that AI systems acquire as they learn, we propose to extend VSD to the full life cycle of AI technologies in order to keep monitoring the potential unintended value consequences and redesign the technology if necessary. A similar idea is voiced in the AI for social good factor. Number one, AI for social good designers should identify falsifiable requirements and test them in incremental steps from the lab to the outside world. The need for ongoing monitoring arises from uncertainties that accompany new technologies that are introduced in society. This adapted approach to VSD process uh, I, we illustrate here. Uh, this illustration serves as a general model that we hope engineers can then use 
to guide them throughout their design program. We suggest that AI for uh, a uh, value sensitive design for AI proceeds in four iterative phases uh, that we uh, that I'll briefly describe. So uh, context analysis. So motivations for design differ across different design projects, of course. For this reason, there is no normative starting point that designers must begin with. VSD acknowledges that technology design can be with, begin with a discrete technology itself as a starting point, a context of use, or a certain value. In all cases, an analysis of the context is crucial. Various contextual variables come into play that impact the way values are understood, which we'll see in the second phase, both in conceptual terms as well as in practice on account of different social, cultural, and political norms. Eliciting stakeholders in social cultural context is imperative within the VSD approach to determine whether the explicated values of the project faithfully map onto those of stakeholders, both direct and indirect. And to that end, empirical investigations play a key role in determining the potential boons or downfalls of any given context. In engaging with the context situated nuances of the various values uh, may come to play in any given system, various pitfalls and constraints can begin to be envisioned, particularly how the initial core values can be understood in terms of technical design requirements, which is the third phase. So um, value identification. The second phase concerns the identification of a set of values that form the starting point of the design process. We suggest three main sources of such values. Uh, values that are be promoted by design, for example, deriving from the SDGs formulated by the UN. Values that should be respected, in particularly those values that have been identified in relation to AI, respect for human autonomy, non-maleficence, uh, fairness, explicability, uh, and thirdly, context-specific values. Um, that are identified in the first phase, in particular, the values held by stakeholders. It should be noted that phase two does not just involve empirical investigations, but it has a distinct normative flavor to it in the sense that it results in an identification of values that are to be upheld um, further in design from a normative point of view. In addition, this phase involves conceptual investigations geared towards uh, at interpreting in context the conceptualization of certain values. So third, formulating design requirements. The, the third phase involves the formulation of uh, design requirements on the basis of the values identified in the previous phase uh, and the contextual analysis of phase one. Here, tools like the value hierarchy can be useful to mutually relate values and design requirements or to translate values into design requirements. We suggest that the translation of values into design requirements is somewhat different for the different sets of values that were formulated in the second phase. The first set of values derived, for example, from the sustainable development goals are values that are to be promoted. They are typically translated into design requirements that are formulated as a criteria that should be achieved as much as possible. The second set of values are those that need to be respected, in particular in relation to AI. Here, the AI for social good factors are particularly helpful to formulate more specific design requirements. These requirements are more likely to be formulated as constraints or boundary conditions rather than as a criteria that should be achieved as much as possible. And these boundary conditions set the deontological constraints that any design needs to meet to be ethically or minimally acceptable. And for the third set of contextual values, the context analysis and in particular the stakeholder analysis will most likely play an important role in how these are to be translated into these design requirements. BSD provides a principled and widely disseminated approach to aiding designers in putting such processes and abstract values into technical practice. And finally, the fourth phase 
is the building of te and testing of prototypes that meet those design requirements. The idea is here in line with what is described more generally in the value sensitive design approach as a value oriented mock up prototype or field deployment it aims at the development analysis and co design of mock ups prototypes and field deployments to scaffold the investigation of values of value implications of technologies that are yet to be built or widely adopted. Our proposal is to extend this space to the entire life cycle of an AI technology, because even if such technologies may initially meet value based design requirements, they may develop in such uh, an unexpected and undesirable effects that can materialize over time, or they no longer achieve the values for which they were intended, or they may have unforeseen side effects which require additional values to be considered in such cases there's reason to redesign the technology and do another iteration of the cycle. And in order to ensure the, uh, I guess you could say adoptability uh, and illustrate the efficacy of this approach, what we do is we provide a, a timely example to more clearly show how the process works by situating it in a figurative context for a specific AI system. Uh, so before I move on to uh, I believe this is the final part uh, on our the application, the illustration of the application. Is there any questions? So <clears throat> thanks, Steve. Let's see. Uh, so does anyone have any questions? Uh, I don't see right now uh, hands. Uh, let's see. Yes. Yeah. I see Derek. And, OK, uh, Derek, uh, please go ahead. Ah, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, really enjoyed so far. Um, some uh, examples would would be helpful and in particular the lower left quadrant um your minimal um uh sorry yeah lower right uh yeah th this middle piece here um you're talking about uh so in in the the specific translation process and the the minimally ethical uh, approach. Do you have a just a, a, a picture in mind or an example system or, or some um, way to, to, to make this uh, idea concrete? Well, uh, the, the, the section that I'm about to or where I'm planning to move now is an application of this entire approach to a contact tracing app. So um, uh, as I'll explain, I'll, I'll be using the German example of a particular concrete technology. Uh, can that'll at least I, I aim to use to help to illustrate this. So OK, yeah, uh, and then if, if you have the same question after, if it's not clear, then we can explore that. Thanks, uh, Inald. Yes, hi, uh, Stephen. Thanks very much. Inald Lagendijk here. Um, most of what you explained so far refers to the design phase of a product or service, right? And as you said, a step by step, slowly move from the lab to uh, deployment and then a, Later on, and, and actually just now, you also mentioned that during the deployment, of course, changes might uh, might occur. Now, um, you said, you know, a certain goal might not be achieved anymore, or certain values might no longer be obeyed. So let us redesign. But of course, the power of uh, AI is not so much that it's self-learning during the design phase. Actually, I would not even call that self-learning. I would call that training. The self-learning aspect only exhibits itself when it is in operation, right? A product in the field being deployed out of the hands of the manufacturer, the programmer, the um, legislative body, etc. So how do you look at that problem once a product is out there and does its thing? Um, how do we, you know, I mean, bringing it back to the lab or to the design phase, it, phase is probably out of the question. So how do you look? How does that fit in your storyline? Let me let me put the question like that. Yeah, I'm interested to hear. So that's actually like extremely interesting. And that's the I guess where some economic values start to come into um, into some serious tension. And this this I think makes more sense when we're talking about the difference between hardware and software. Of course, when we have hardware deployment, uh, a, a total recall, although not unprecedented for certain technologies uh, like certain vehicles is has a lot of economic barriers. That's that's for sure. It's not unheard of either for um, this type of redesign to be more. Hmm, th this type of post hoc redesign to be undertaken when we're talking about the software side, so the ability for 
uh, designers, let's say a company to roll out either either updates or uh, put a freeze on a certain firmware update. I, I can see this definitely becoming a particular issue. Um, I'm actually unsure. Do you have any idea on how that can actually be undertaken uh, if we put aside the, the, more, the tension with economic values uh, or what would actually happen in the real world? But just from a, a conceptual, I guess, um, approach, how would this actually be undertaken? Undertaken in the sense of, I mean, I mean, there's these, there are a number of well-known examples, also operational, um, maybe from limited domains. But for instance, there is this company that trained a um, um, medical diagnosis system in their lab. The system was certified because it had a certain performance according to some, to some standards. Blah blah blah. It was shipped out. But this was a self-learning system. So the opinion of the medical uh, doctors in the hospital where the software was installed was then factored into further training. So this was indeed self-learning. So the system started to deviate from the original um, um, you know, shipped product, not in the sense that the code was different, not at all, but there was just different uh, samples being fed into the system. And therefore, let's say the implicit decision boundaries of the neural net or decision tree or whatever they were using were shifted because of the operation in the field. Now that, that already brings questions of who is responsible. Eh? So the whole responsibility uh, um, uh, accountability discussion uh, starts to play a, a role. But I'm interested to see how that story then fits in your VSD um, you know, design principle. Um, maybe I'll explain that a little bit later, but in terms uh, as of right now, in terms of the AI for social good um, factors, particularly receiver contextualized explanation and transparent purposes, um, there has to be a, a means by which such systems, and maybe the example you brought up that, that was present, is why does the system do what it does? Yes, in light of its field deployment, both differently to the users as well as to the designers. Is there a way to track and trace the decision-making, I guess you could say, architecture uh, architecture of the system itself in order to understand why it does what it does. It's not necessary, and I don't know if it's necessarily important in terms of the the actual token action of, of the machine, but the, the typology of action uh, as promoting social good or being constrained by by certain uh, ethical values. So it's kind of, is it more important the car that's on the road or the, how the road itself is built that allows what kind of car on it? So I'm speaking mostly in terms of the decision of a system based on its inputs and then therefore its outputs. Uh, I would actually be interested in that particularly example itself is what kind of um, designer intervention is built into that kind of system post deployment? Uh, do does the designers or the industry that's responsible for its design have continual monitoring uh, of such a system in order to roll out impromptu updates uh, in light of maybe a recalcitrant uh, or an unforeseeable decision that the system made? Uh, I would actually be interested in that if maybe later you can send me the, a link to that particular that particular example. Okay. Steven, uh, <clears throat> so just before you move on, just one, uh, I just wanted to jump in and ask you what about the design requirements part. I, I was curious, what are your thoughts on how do we avoid uh, technical solutionism in this part? So I mean by that coming into the design process with a preconceived notion that we're already going to solve everything with AI in this case. So how do we do this truly in a socio-technical manner in your opinion to recognize that and i think you kind of refer to this here because you say it's both process and product requirements so there's a, and i'm curious what are your thoughts about the process because what are the human to human interactions organizational practices that need to be around how do we open up our imagination to include that in our thinking well i guess one of the main interventions is the the direct and indirect stakeholder elicitations which the value sensitive design approach has probably more than five different methodologies for stakeholder identification, stakeholder elicitation, and then their value identification, translation, understanding, and analysis. 
Um, whether or not those specific, and it technically is not exclusive or exhaustive, that list, that's just the current list and it's continually being updated coming from the social sciences. So there are interventions on kind of breaking open the bubble of a design program in order to get these new types of perspective. Envisioning cards is actually a, a pretty excellent way of opening up innovation, um, particularly from a more closed off domain. When we when we move into realms like the military, for example, military innovation, that's where things start to get uh, a little bit more dicey uh, because of its closed nature. But in terms of the solutionism that they bring up, I think that the empirical investigations of particular stakeholder values are not only important but necessary, uh, not only if you want to uh, undertake the value sensitive design approach because that's one of its fundamental tenets, but it's done that it's it's there for a reason. It's there for that, I think, exact reason. It's moving outside of what would be a limited domain space of uh, of design thinking. Thank you. So I see there's more questions coming, but let me first let you move on with the presentation and then we see you in the time left if we can. Yeah, so this questions. is just this is the last section uh, just uh, as an example, and then I guess we can we can talk. OK. Sounds good. OK, so um, on Tuesday, April 7th, 2020, so this is a slightly outdated, uh, the, the Robert uh, Cook Institute, the German Federal Research uh, Institute responsible for disease control and prevention, uh, prompted German citizens with smartphones and smartwatches to voluntarily share their health data to keep track of the spread of COVID-19. The RKI, that Robert Cook Institute, uh, is rolling out. I'm not sure, maybe some of you would know if it has been fully rolled out or rolled back. Um, the app called Corona Dat uh, Data Spend, uh, the Corona Data Donation, which allows users to voluntarily and uh, pseudonymously share their health data to aid scientists in determining symptoms related to COVID-19 infections and its distribution across the nation as well as to gauge the efficacy of the amelioration measures that they put into place. The app allows users to record their age, height, weight, gender uh, metrics, such as physical activity, uh, body temperature, sleep behavior, heart rate, as well as postal code. Uh, Lothar Wedler, head of the RKI, uh, said that the collected information will help to better estimate where and how fast COVID-19 is spreading in Germany. And the RKI is explicit that the collected data of individual users are labeled as uh, pseudonyms, that the personal information of users, such as names and addresses, remain private through the de-identification of user data through artificial identifiers, leaving the possibility of re-identifying data subjects open. Uh, likewise, the machine learning systems underlying the app are designed to recognize symptoms that are associated with, among other things, a coronavirus infection. And these include, for example, an increased uh, resting heart rate, uh, changes in sleep activity and behavior. And the data donated uh, is said to be only used for scientific purposes. And after careful preparation, the data flows into a map that visually shows the spread of potentially infected people down to the zip code level. And all, I believe still in its infancy regarding the deployment stages, uh, Keep in mind that when we were doing this research, it was at the beginning of the outbreak. Um, we can still il illustrate the design. We'll just use as an example for the design of the Corona Death and Spend app, albeit ex post facto in this case, using the framework we that I outlined already. And the goal here is to demonstrate how this modified VSD approach can be adopted uh, to a specific technology and should not be read as providing the actual design requirements for the app, uh, albeit still providing some food for thought for those engaging in the design of it. So um, context, so as mentioned, VSD acknowledges that technology design can begin with a discrete technology as itself as a starting point, the context of use or a certain value. In this case, the context of use can be understood as the motivating factor behind the technological solution. Simply put, the outbreak spread and eventual declaration of a global pandemic of COVID-19 
provides the context of use and development. The immediate health crisis demands swift action to be taken in order to stifle further spreading, but also the desire to return to less strict measures at some point, uh, some point post pandemic um, is also uh, warranted. A prima facie analysis of the values at play here can be said to be tensions between more immediate public health and economic uh, stability and prosperity. The development of an app can specifically be targeted at trying to balance this tension uh, as a tracking and tracing app may assist in uh, resuming certain social activities like traveling or work. It's in a way that still reduces health risks as much as possible by tracing who is potentially infected. Value identification. So firstly, values that are to be promoted by the design. And for example, those ones that are deriving from the sustainable development goals. The design of the Corona Death and Spend app can be said to be part of a large network of, uh, to support, for example, Sustainable Development Goal 3, Good Health and Well-Being, which aims, among other sub-objectives, to focus on providing more efficient funding of health systems, improved sanitation and hygiene, increased access to physicians, and more tips on ways to reduce ambient pollution. Albeit an impromptu technology introduced as a response to an immediate context, in situ deployment and use may encourage applications outside the original context, for example, outside of Germany and also perhaps for other illnesses. Secondly, values that should be respected, uh, in particular those that have been identified in relation to artificial intelligence, so respect for human autonomy, uh, prevention of harm, fairness, and explicability. Respect for human autonomy in the context of AI systems, autonomy refers to the balance between the power humans have in making decisions and how much of that power is abdicated to those systems. Not only should machines be designed in such a way as to promote human autonomy, but they should be designed also to constrain the abdication of too much human decision-making power particularly where such human decision-making outweighs the value of the efficacy of the machine's decision-making capability. Uh, and this is aligned with Sustainable Development Goal 16, for example, peace, justice, and strong institutions, particularly the sub-goal of 16.7, ensuring responsive, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision-making at all levels. Prevention of harm or uh, non non-maleficence is framed as preventing potential risks and harms from manifesting themselves in systems by understanding their capabilities and limits. Often questions of data privacy and security are evoked as to how individuals control their personal data. The RKI in Germany is explicit that it does not collect personal user information beyond the level of postal codes to understand transmission densities. However, privacy concerns still exist at the community levels nonetheless, particularly in the practices used to store, use, share, archive, and destroy collective data. Risks of regional gerrymandering, targeted solicitation or discrimination are not, uh, are not excluded solely on account of delimiting data collection to the postal code level. Harm may occur due to the specific ways the app is used particularly if the app is not only used to map the spread of the virus, but also to trace individuals as potential bearers of, of disease and risk factors. Um, and I'll discuss that more in the contextual values. Fairness, uh, which is albeit an ambiguous one and often described and defined in different ways and specific, uh, specified across different points in the life cycle of AI and its relation with human beings. Fairness can be understood as being framed as justice, as Floridi and, uh, and company do at Oxford. Uh, and they sum up various definitions of justice in at least three ways, using AI to correct past wrongs, such as eliminating unfair discrimination, ensuring that the use of AI creates benefits that are shared or at least shareable, and finally, preventing the creation of new harms, such as the undermining of existing social structures, which is directly in line with Sustainable Development Goal 16, at the very least, peace, justice, and strong institutions. 
And finally, explicability. Uh, the employed AI systems, in order to support the other values, must be explicable. This means that its inner workings must be intelligible. That means not opaque. And there must be at least one agent that is accountable for the way it works. And uh, they understand the way it works and are thus responsible for its actions, whatever you can define agent as an individual or group. And finally, in value identification, context specific values that are not covered by one or two. In particular, the values held by stakeholders. And we refer here to the development of like the Dutch tracing and tracking app to illustrate how contextual values may be relevant for the design of such an app. So like in the Netherlands, uh, at least at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, 60 scientists and experts wrote the open letter to the Dutch government in which they warned against the number of risks and un unintended effects of tracing and tracking app. I wouldn't doubt if some of them are here listening. Um, among other things, they pointed out that such an app may lead to stigmatization and discrimination and might, depending on how it would be used, endanger fundamental human rights, like the right of association. And they draw attention to the fact that the app might give a false sense of security, which might lead people to no longer strictly following the requirements for social distancing, which may increase rather than decrease health risks. And although it was announced by the German government that Corona data spend would be voluntarily, uh, voluntary, scholars also pointed out that the app might nevertheless be used to allow access to certain services like public transport or might become requirement by their employer, uh, by employers for their employees, which would endanger the voluntariness of its use. Such potential uses might in turn also invite individuals to not properly use the app in order to keep maximum freedom of movement and to co uh, conceal certain contacts by turning off their phone, for example, which again might contribute to health risks. So many of the risks and potential side effects mentioned by scholars for the, the COVID-19 apps map onto the values we already discussed uh, previously, in particular health values under one and uh, non-maleficence, justice, autonomy and explicability under two. For example, a false sense of security relates to the value of health and privacy and uh, voluntariness to the value of autonomy, while stigmatization and discrimination relate to fairness. Nevertheless, there are also values like the right to association, for example, uh, security against hacking or misuse that are less clearly related to one of those values, although they can perhaps be subsumed under non-maleficence. Nevertheless, uh, the, what the issues particularly show is that we should consider values in context in order to gain a full awareness of what is at stake and how to translate these concerns into tangible design requirements. In this specific case, it's, for example, particularly important what behavioral effects apps will have. And it's also crucial to view the values in a broader system, uh, broader systems context. In this sense, even if a contextual analysis may not reveal completely new values, it will nevertheless be crucial in understanding how values are exactly at stake for specific application, how these values are to be understood in the specific case and how they translate into design requirements. The third step, as we mentioned above, is the actual formulation of design requirements. So to illustrate how tools like the value hierarchy can be used to visualize and aid designers in translating abstract values from the technical design requirements. We provide a specific instance of the tool here. And of course, this should be taken as one of numerous iterations that can occupy any given vector in the hierarchy. But this is just one example. Here, the value of non-maleficence was chosen as the more abstract higher level value that was then translated through two AI for social good factors, five and six, and then into technical design requirements. In this paradigm, AI for social good factors are adopted as norms, and rightly so, given that they are framed as imperatives by Floridian Company. Naturally, any given context of use, value, and specific technology will implicate a number of combinations, and there is no exclusive nor exhaustive route for satisfying a value translation, and it can move in, bot in a bottom-up direction also, uh, design requirements to norms to values, as well as how you see it here as top-down, from values to norms to design requirements. Uh, situa situational fairness, for example, could just as easily and probably should be used as the normative tool for operationalizing other values such as explicability. 
uh, transparent data set collection use storage, as well as justice, which can be understood as promoting non-discriminatory laws and practices through unbiased compliance. Uh, an example of this would be the fairness warnings or fair mammal, which have recently been proposed. And at a functional level, the normative structure of AI for social good norms supports avoiding most ethical harms associated with artificial intelligence systems. However, they per se do not guarantee that all new AI applications will contribute to the social good. The higher level values that I spoke about in conjunction with related real operalization of the sustainable development goals allow more salient AI systems to be developed that contribute to social good, global beneficence. This multi-tiered approach of coupling AI specific values, stakeholder values, and their application to sustainable development goals attained via AI for social good norms can mitigate the dangers posed by ethical whitewashing that occurs through the legitimization of AI technologies that do not respect some fundamental, uh, fundamental AI principles. Regarding this type of visualization uh, can be used across different sources of values as listed above, uh, such as the sustainable development goals and stakeholder values to determine how accurately related values can produce both similar and different technical design requirements. I think a fruitful future research project could do this empirically by taking any particular AI technology and provide thorough value to design requirement translations to determine the effectiveness of this approach. Uh, regardless, our aim here is to help designers to more effectively design for various values in mind, uh, ones that are oftentimes erroneously conflated or altogether sidelined. And finally, prototyping, as I briefly mentioned, involves building mock-ups of the technology in question according to the design requirements laid out in the previous step. This means that the technology is moved from the more controlled space of the lab or design space and in situ, which of course implicates direct and indirect stakeholder values. At this point, various design decisions may prove to be recalcitrant or unforeseen recalcitrant behavior emerges that implicates other values. At this point, given the technology's limited deployment, it can be recalled into the design space so that the corrective modifications can be implemented. Regarding the Corona Data Spend app, for example, the crisis situation that underlies the motivation be, uh, behind the app's inception invites direct deployment rather than prototyping, given the stakes at play and the urgency for amelioration. Although tempting, this may ultimately be unwise, uh, given that the significant risks that AI systems possess, particularly ones predicated on such large quantities of data subjects, uh, small-scale deployment or in-house testing of the efficacy and fidelity of the app's underlying systems are necessary, although not sufficient, conditions for responsibly developing an AI system of this type to ensure that it can help to achieve positive ethical and social values like beneficence, justice, explicability, and the associated distal sustainable development goals while reducing ethical AI risks, non-maleficence. What should be particularly stressed is that prototyping should not be restricted to testing the proper technical functioning of an app but should, be, uh, should take into account behavior as well as societal effects and ultimately the effects of these on values. Here, the tracking and tracing app is a case in point. While some value issues like privacy may be addressed through technical choices like pseudonymization, local storage of data and automatic destruction of data after a certain period of time, some other value concerns require insight in the behavior effects of such an app. Such behavior effects are very hard, if not impossible, to reliably predict without some form of prototyping, at least small scale testing in situ. It would therefore be advisable to go through a number of trials for such an app that scale up from very small scale testing with mockups to testing in test settings of increasing size, not unlike what is done in medical experiments with new drugs. Such testing trajectories might also reveal new values that are at stake and need to be taken into account and so thus triggering a new iteration of the design cycle. 
So just uh, to conclude, so we can sum up. So what I aim to discuss here is how AI systems can pose certain challenges for the value sensitive design approach to technology design. These challenges are primarily the consequence of the use of machine learning approaches to artificial intelligence. Machine learning poses two challenges for VSD. Firstly, it may be opaque, at least to humans, how an AI system has learned certain things, which requires attention to such values such as transparency, explicability, and accountability. Secondly, machine learning may lead to AI systems adapting themselves in such a way that they disembody the values that have been embodied in them in, by VSD designers. In order to deal with these challenges, we propose an extension of the value sensitive design approach to the whole life cycle of AI systems design. More specifically, we tried to illustrate how the AI for social good factors proposed by Floridian company can be integrated as norms in VSD when considering AI design. In order to integrate the AI for social good factors into a more uh, systematic VSD approach, we proposed a design process that consists of four iterative basic steps, contextual analysis, uh, value identification, design, and prototyping. At the core of this model is a two-tiered approach to values in AI, one consisting of a real commitment to contributing to the social good, uh, beneficence through AI, and two, the formulation and an adherence to a number of concrete AI for social good factors. Without the first tier, AI for social good principles may help to avoid most ethical harms, but there's no guarantee at all that the new AI applications will actively contribute to social good. Without the second tier, there's a danger that the contribution to the societal challenges and SDGs are used for legitimization of AI technologies that do not respect some fundamental ethical principles. For example, there's a danger of ethical whitewashing, which is already visible on the web pages of some large companies. In addition to these two tiers of values, we aim to argue that uh, there's an importance to pay attention to contextual values, or at least the contextual interpretation of the values from the two mentioned tiers. And this is necessary to understand why certain values are at stake for a specific application and how to translate those relevant values into design requirements. And before I leave you, I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to a call for papers that I am co-editing in the Journal of Technoethics Techno on engineering ethics, bridging the theory practice gap. Uh, if any of you are interested in contributing, you can just uh, write, shoot me an email later. Uh, deadline is December 1st. So I guess we can discuss now if anybody has questions. Stephen, thank you very, very much. So officially we're out of time right now, but I, if uh, anybody can stick around for a couple of minutes and ask a question, so I will leave the floor open for a couple of questions uh, to be asked. So Herman, if you're still with us, um, you can ask your question if you'd like to still do so. Yeah, thanks Evgeny. Uh, thanks yep. uh, Stephen. Uh, Herman Felumkamp here. Uh, so that was super interesting. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, I really like is how you combine the AI for social goods and the typical uh, VSD values. And you distinguish between values that uh, sh uh, to be respected and the values to be promoted. So the main question I have is, so is there a difference in how they translate into design requirements? So I think you mentioned one difference. You say that values to be respected should be seen as boundary conditions, the deontic constraints. And what, how apt that is. So, for example, if you look at privacy, uh, this is, I think, is one of the values that is to be respected in your in your model. But isn't that also also something that we typically want more of? So, uh, you talk in, in your example, you you um, you say that uh, pseudonyms are used. Uh, of course, it seems it would be better if we would completely anonymize all data, but. I think the makers don't do that because they trade off this value with some other value, such as health benefits or something. So isn't so? Yeah. So that made me wonder if this distinction that you make is really apt. Uh, so thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I exactly understood um, the question in terms, particularly with the example of, uh, of privacy. Um, there is perhaps um, 
a way of confusing the levels of uh, the tiers of, of uh, so value sources uh, with the AI for social good factors, which um, I think even the original authors perhaps even confuse them. That they seem to be offering ethical principles, but they're actually framed as uh, normative constraints. Uh, designers should do this. So that's where we see that that, that normative operation uh, of, I guess you can say, uh, a practice. So it seems very practice oriented, the AI for social good factors, which we just call norms. Uh, and we choose them because they are particular to AI and they're mostly based on or they overlap with uh, some of these higher level, more abstract values um, like privacy, perhaps. Um, privacy, even through the AI for social good factors, can even be understood as a boundary constraint, uh, the way Floridi uh, and company do that, um, because things like transparency and privacy protection, data subject consent, uh, are, are um, how can I say this? They define it. As a, as a normative boundary. So we didn't include uh, privacy, for example, as a higher level abstract value, but rather as a norm through which every other of the two levels or um, two tiers of values can be translated through. So privacy uh, protection and data subject consent are continually present throughout the entire design process of these types of AI systems as a way of translating higher level abstract values into more technical design requirements. Uh, as I mentioned, the AI for social good principles are not to be taken as either mutually exclusive rank ordered, but co vary with one another. Uh, that's why I did kind of leave open uh, at the end, perhaps because I don't even know how to do it. Uh, in terms of these numerous amounts of value translations that could be undertaken for any number of higher level values through these seven different uh, uh, AI for social good factors and in numerous um, combinations of the two can become slightly unwieldy. And that's why I mentioned the only way I can feasibly see uh, the adoptability of this kind of approach is through some sort of empirical investigation of whether or not it's um, effective or not, because it does leave kind of the floodgates open in terms of the, the practical on the ground work an engineer or design team has to go through in order to come up with a list of actionable design requirements that they can actually begin building um, a system with. I even got close to answering your question uh, and I just spoke a lot of random words. <laughs> yeah, so 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 maybe you so yeah, if so if I have time uh, Jenny, so if there are no other questions, um, I will. Do we have time? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't see any other raised hands, so go ahead, Herman. OK, good. So so maybe you can can um, just help me understand so, so, you, so one of the things you said, well, we shouldn't see privacy as a value, but as a norm. So that's that's fine. Uh, so, can you give another example of a value that that, in your sense, sh that it that is a boundary condition, and that, um, and I think what you mean with that is, is there if there is a certain level that's enough, then it, then our application with that, or with respect to that value, it is minimally ethical. Um, because when I try to think of examples, these albums are always such that I think, yeah, well, of course, some level is fine, but more is always better. So there's still always this trade off. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, should we frame them as like that type of moral overload as a trade off or just as um, uh, uh, an engineering problem of not being, of not finding the, the proper design solution towards accommodating? as much as possible. Of course, there's the, the question of ambiguity of limits. It's, you know, more is, if, if the argument is more is always greater, it's like at what point do we just say, let's release it? Uh, because the, maybe they can always add more. Uh, I, as I mentioned, the AI for social good 
factors as norms are a minimum necessary but not sufficient condition. They are not, or as, as our framework, they are not sufficient on their own. Uh, in order to actually have AI for social good and global beneficence, it also needs to actively contribute to the social good, not just avoid most ethical harms. Um, so there's also the, the engineering question, which is actually usually what most engineers say when I bring up things like value tensions or, or use the word trade-offs. It's, that's just an engineering problem. That's not a, a philosophical problem, uh, which may or may not be the case. I'm actually not sure. I'm not an engineer. Um, so <laughs> um, uh, it is a there. The way the AI for social good value uh, principle or factor that you mentioned, the privacy protection and data subject consent is strictly defined by uh, Floridi. I don't have the definition in front of me else. I would read it uh, what they a minim minimum necessary but not sufficient condition for um, having minimally ethical AI, what, however you want to frame that, that phrase, but as a necessary process for designing AI, AI systems based on these type of machine learning or deep neural net, uh, nets. Good, uh, thanks, uh, Stephen. Yeah, thank you very much. So guys, I'd like to wrap up uh, the meeting. So I'm sure that there, we, we could engage in more conversations. So I hope you can, uh, anybody who wants to follow up with Steven, uh, you, you will be able to follow up offline. You Steven, just email, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you can find Steven's information in the Agora meeting uh, event in your calendars. Steven, I'd like to thank you very much again for making the time and for sharing your uh, your work with us today uh and uh, your insights uh and thanks very much everyone for joining and uh, please uh take care and stay safe uh, are, are you ready to not close the uh the meeting and we can wander out on our own you well you're welcome if uh steven so yeah please if, if you have time you can go yeah, ahead Stephen, guys. <laughs> take take off whenever you like but uh i figure just in the the model of uh meet meetings uh we could uh take take the same open I, I leave that up to you guys. <laughs> Great. <laughs>